Hello and welcome to Arcadia University's BI 327 uh, histology course. Uh, this is part three of the cytology lecture where we're going to start to look at what's occurring within the cytoplasm. Now to start out with the cytoplasm, uh, basically I have to define what it is. Uh, it's going to be the cytosol, which in essence is a fluid, but it's more than just water. Uh, it's going to be ions, uh, sodium, potassium, chloride, uh, metabolites like sugar molecules, amino acids, uh, a number of enzymes are going to be present here, and lots and lots of other things are going to be present. Also within the cytoplasm are going to be organelles. Now organelles are often, you can think about them as like little organs of the body, and so they're going to form a lot of the same types of, uh, not the same structures, but the same type of functions that you would see within an entire organism. They're going to be fulfilling similar functions within that subcellular level. And so these little organs are going to have distinct structures and distinct functions associated with them. And now it's important to keep in mind that these organelles may be membrane bound uh, with a plasma membrane around the outside, like a mitochondria or like a lysosome, or they may be non-membrane bound, uh, like the cytoskeleton, which we'll talk about later on. There can also be cytoplasmic inclusions, and cytoplasmic inclusions or essentially just clumps or deposits of materials, like clumps of carbohydrates, uh, clumps of lipids, clumps of pigments uh, that can be present within the cell. Okay, so if we take a look at what's going to be growing out within the cell, one of the prominent things is going to be protein synthesis. And so we're going to take a look at this. And again, hopefully remembering from you know, earlier biology courses, you know the basic process of protein synthesis. We're going to have ribosomes and ribosomes are the protein synthesizing organelles. These things are going to be floating around within the cytoplasm. Generally, uh, they're going to be two subunits, a large and a small subunit. They're going to come together when protein synthesis is going to be occurring. Uh, but essentially, they're going to be a combination of ribosomal RNA, proteins, and enzymes uh, forming a relatively complex structure, which is going to allow us to translate the messenger RNA message into an amino acid sequence so that we can build the proteins that are needed by the cell. Now, for cytoplasmic proteins, the proteins that are found kind of floating around within the cytoplasm of the cell, we can see protein synthesis occurring on either free ribosomes or what we refer to as polysomes. Uh, a free ribosome is essentially an individual ribosome moving around within the cytoplasm. And as we said, we have a small subunit and a large subunit. These subunits don't usually come together until they have a messenger RNA to work with. And if they've got that messenger RNA, they're going to attach to it and they're going to build a protein. Now in most cases, what we're going to see within the cell is that a single piece of messenger RNA may have multiple ribosomes associated with it. So a ribosome attaches to it, starts making a protein, and then another ribosome starts to the beginning, attaches to the beginning, and starts to make a protein. So it's a little bit further behind in the process. But as it's moving along, it's going to open up that start location again. And another ribosome can attach to it and start making a third protein. And so again, what we have then is a polysome, essentially multiple ribosomes, moving along a single strand of messenger RNA, making the same protein, but multiple copies of that protein. And then based on where it is along that messenger RNA molecule, determines how much of that protein has been produced. Okay, so what we can see is that these free polysomes or free ribosomes floating around within the cytoplasm are going to be making things like structural proteins or enzymes that are going to be used within the cytoplasm. But there are going to be a lot of times in which we need to build a protein associated with a membrane or we're going to build proteins that need to be separated from the rest of the cell. Uh, they need to be sequestered in some way. There may be digestive enzymes for use within the cell or they may be things that are going to be released from the cell. And so we basically want to synthesize them and store them in a location as opposed to synthesizing them and trying to, you know, track them down and accumulate them in some way. And so what we have is the rough endoplasmic reticulum is going to be a membrane-bound structure, and it's going to have a rough appearance, in essence, because it has ribosomes or polysomes associated with it. And so what happens is, the ribosomes are going to be attached onto these membrane-bound structures. It's going to be docked to the membrane. And as they're synthesizing the proteins, they're essentially going to be injecting this amino acid sequence 
into the cisterna, into the lumen, into the inside of this membrane-bound rough endoplasmic reticulum. So that as the proteins are being formed, they're already going to be stored. They're going to already be within these membrane-bound structures within the rough endoplasmic reticulum. Now, the rough endoplasmic reticulum, where the proteins are going to be synthesized, the materials are going to then be transported to the Golgi complex or the Golgi apparatus, two names for the same basic structure. And so using that process we talked about previously with exocytosis and endocytosis, we're going to be looking at the movement of materials within a membrane-bound structure from the rough endoplasmic reticulum into the Golgi apparatus. And then again, using that same concept of endocytosis and exocytosis, we're going to move materials from the different portions, the different membrane-bound structures within the Golgi apparatus, from the cis phase, the forming phase, to uh, the trans phase, the maturing phase. We're going to be moving these materials from one cisternate to the next cisternate to the next cisternate within these membrane-bound structures. And what's going to happen then is we got a lot of these membrane-bound vesicles, the membrane-bound structures are going to be moving along the Golgi apparatus. Now the Golgi apparatus is going to be very well defined, very well developed in secretory cells. So things like gland cells are going to be releasing digestive enzymes uh, and things like nerve cells. Uh, but you can also find it in a lot of other cells as well. And a number of things are going to be happening within the Golgi apparatus. The first is going to be post-translational modification. The rough endoplasmic reticulum is going to be involved with in essence, creating that amino acid sequence that forms the protein. The Golgi apparatus is going to be going through and modifying that protein. It's going to be going through and adding glycosylation. It's going to be adding sugar molecules onto the protein. Uh, it's going to be lengthening and shortening these sugar molecules. Uh, it's going to be uh, essentially modifying the protein in some way before it's being uh, stored into one of these membrane-bound structures. As these materials are passing through the Golgi apparatus, they're going to be sorted, and so that they end up in the proper location. Uh, it may be towards a specific region or a specific organelle uh, within the cell. And it's also going to be involved with packing secretory products for release. And so if it's a material that's going to be stored like a digestive enzyme, and released, they're going to be packed within a membrane-bound structure, prepared for release, but then stored until it's time to release them uh, in response to some type of trigger. So if we take a look at this then, a lot of what we're focusing in on are going to be these vesicles, these membrane-bound structures that are going to be found within the cell. And depending upon what they're doing at any given point in time and their location, they may be referred to as transport vesicles, storage vesicles, or secretory vesicles. Transport vesicles are essentially moving materials from one location to another. Storage vesicles are basically storing it or sequestering it for uh, some region. Or secretory vesicles are going to be involved with actually releasing it from the cell. But the same basic concept, that we've got materials that are within this membrane-bound structure. We also have uh, endocytotic and exocytotic, uh, essentially membrane-bound vesicles, involved with either endocytosis or exocytosis. Again, taking a look at this in a little bit greater detail than we covered before, exocytosis is going to be a controlled release of material from the cell. So like the release of the neurotransmitter in our previous example, or the release of a digestive enzyme. So the enzyme is going to be produced as a protein within the rough endoplasmic reticulum. It's going to be modified within the Golgi apparatus maintained within a membrane-bound structure, and then stored. And then in response to a signal, this membrane-bound structure is going to fuse with that external plasma membrane so that we don't lose cytoplasm. And all we do is with the fusion of these membranes, we're going to dump out whatever that material is outside of the cell. And so a very controlled, very regulated release of materials without the risk of things leaking out of the cell uh, as we're doing it. Endocytosis is essentially the opposite thing occurring. We're doing the controlled uptake or the controlled intake of materials from outside of the cell into the cell. And so essentially instead of a 
membrane bound structure inside of the cell fusing and dumping materials out, we're going to look at essentially the external plasma membrane engulfing some material, surrounding some material, pinching it off into a membrane bound vesicle, and then bringing it into the cell itself. And again, depending upon the, the volume of material that we're looking at, we can do phagocytosis, which is the movement of a larger solid material, or pinocytosis, which is essentially engulfing uh, materials that are kind of smaller and dissolved within that extracellular fluid. Uh, but both are examples of endocytosis. We can also see receptor-mediated endocytosis, which is that thing that's occurring on the, the left hand, I'm sorry, the right hand portion of this diagram. What we've got, in essence, are going to be receptors, which are going to be accumulating, binding to whatever the material is that we want to collect, binding to it, and concentrating it into this region. So as opposed to, you know, kind of just reaching out and trying to grab something, we're concentrating it before we're bringing it in. And so we're able to bring it in, bring these materials in, and in most cases, recycling our receptors back towards uh, the plasma membrane surface so that they can be used over again. But again, a very controlled mechanism for bringing materials within the cell. Now, in many cases, what we want to do is bring materials within the cell for the process of intracellular digestion. And again, this is similar to what I said, that there's subcellular organelles uh, within the cell that are going to be doing similar to things than what we would have our organs doing within an entire body. So an example of this are lysosomes, which are going to be involved with intracellular digestion. They're membrane-bound vesicle. They're going to be filled with enzymes for breaking things down. They're going to be filled with acids. So as you can imagine, we want to keep these lysosomes and the materials within the lysosomes intact. We don't want enzymes and acids floating around within the cell because they're going to indiscriminately digest materials within the cell that we need. Okay, so we're going to see these as membrane-bound structures, enzymes and acids packed within them, and they're going to be very abundant in phagocytic cells like macrophages and neutrophils, but they're going to be involved with intracellular digestion in a controlled way. So if we take a look at this, the lysosome essentially has the enzymes and the acids for breaking down materials. An endosome or a phagosome is essentially a, a, a membrane-bound vesicle that has brought in some type of material from the outside. Okay, so we're going to combine these things, the primary lysosome with the enzymes, with the phagosome, which has material to be digested, and we're going to form a secondary lysosome, where we're basically going to combine the enzymes and the materials to be digested, and so we can break that down. So in essence, we're looking at this intracellular, inside of the cell digestive system. Now, in some long-lived cells, uh, we may have some what we refer to as residual bodies, which are these secondary lysosomes that are packed with materials that can't be digested. Uh, and again, that's going to be an identifying characteristic of things like neurons when we go through and look at them. If you have any questions, feel free to email me at hoffmanj at arcadia.edu. Thanks.